afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here uh, at this session called Gardening Complexity. First time, and um, I'll also be moderating this discussion. We have a bunch of speakers. We do have a break in the middle, about an hour from now. Um, during the break, you will also be able to uh, try out uh, something that uh, Stas has made. There's a setup right there. He will introduce it right before the break, so you guys can play with it. <clears throat> um, Gardening complexity is the title of this uh, of this session. It's one of the research themes we, we, we want to investigate in the next couple of years. It's time we've 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 tried we've played with it already a bit, uh, mainly with uh, together with the Technical University in Eindhoven, where Kurt van Menswort, who's sitting next to me, uh, also works. That's also why he's here. Um, we think it's a very important and interesting theme. Uh, it, it's, in, it's interesting because it's all around us, the whole idea of complexity. Um, <clears throat> in our society, everything is becoming complex. We can see this everywhere. The, you know, the, the banking system has become so complex that it's out of control. And in many other systems, you see, we see similarities. And um, there's a famous quote from uh, Taku, our artistic director, who's sitting right there. Who once said, "I have uh, a couple of a couple hundred snare drums on my computer. What do I do with them?" <laughs> uh, and the same goes for and all the other instruments as well. You know, if you buy a computer, the chances are it's going to be loaded with tons and tons of instruments and, and and ways of making music and ways of making, you know, sounds and doing all these other things. It's it it is really very complicated uh, and complex. Um, many people approach this by Making things easy, making things simple. They pick one thing and use that. I'm not, you know, we're not saying that's a, the wrong approach. It's definitely a, an approach that works for for, for very many people. Uh, it's also an approach that's 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 being chosen by many more conservative politicians. You know, everybody. If you look at the, at, the, at the politics, especially in Holland, there's a very strong strong sort of nostalgic uh, feeling of we want to go back to the 50s when when life was simple. Which obviously, you know, it probably wasn't. Uh, <laughs> it was, it was very nasty in other kinds of ways. But since we tend to only remember the good things about the past, there is a strong nostalgic uh, trend in in politics at the moment, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that many people feel they don't grasp their their lives anymore the way they may may have used to or the way their their parents did. Uh, in some ways, life was more simple uh, decades ago or a century ago. Uh, and the same, of course, goes goes for musicians. Uh, you, now that all of music's history is more or less available online, um, your whole frame of reference has indeed become very complex. And uh, therefore, we've said, well, let's 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 try and see if we can uh, if we can if if we can make this work for us. How can this whole idea of complexity be a source of inspiration rather than a frustrating thing that gets in the way of what we want to do? How can you actually make it work for you rather than against you? So that's one of the questions, you know, one of the research questions that's time, you know, we'd really like to address in the next couple of years. Uh, so it's, and it's also a bit of a call to anybody who's interested in <coughs> issues like this. Please come to us and we'd love to work with you uh, uh, researching this. Uh, this afternoon we have a, a, a you know a, a bunch of speakers uh, that that range from more or less theoretical to very practical. We have uh, theoreticians and we have artists. Uh, there's a uh, Kurt from uh, from Technical University. I'll, I'll introduce everyone right before they talk in, in more detail. There's two <coughs> Tess and Sonia from Optophonica and Chris Salter from Canada. Uh, and I think we have a nice range of. Uh, of speakers about this subject. Um, first speaker is Kurt van Menswort. Uh, he works as, let's see, his big thing, well, Kurt's big thing is nextnature.net. Basically, that, that, that is really something he's been working on for, for, for many years. Uh, and the idea is our nature is not, no, not, not only biological any longer. The nature we, we were born in and the nature we live in uh, is not just this uh, biological environment. But Kurt's going to talk, he's going to talk about that uh, a lot. He's also an assistant uh, professor in, at the TU Eindhoven, at the Industrial Design Department. 
and he also does research there in, in this field. So he basically does two things. He has his own foundation, which does really cool stuff, and they're going to publish a great book in November, I think, right? Thank you for plugging our book. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Um, and he will enlighten us now about uh, how to garden complexity. Cool. Okay, thank you, Dick. Uh, we agreed that I would stand here. Well, I use this mic because otherwise I have to... Um, well, first of all, Dick already introduced me uh, briefly. Um, I'm a lot of things. I'm an artist, a scientist, a designer, an engineer, a philosopher, a writer, a blogger. I'm not a musician. So, just that you know, I'm, In that case. I'm, not, a, I'm not a musician. And um, if I can get my screen up, is that possible? Yeah, then, um, yeah, no, it's there. So, uh, but still I'm here to talk about gardening uh, uh, complexity. And, uh, well, the first thing you do when you get the theme of uh, gardening complexity and think about what you're going to say, you, of course, you use Google. And then you find this kind of images. So, in particular, <laughs> according to Google, this is gardening complexity. I don't agree with Google, I must say. Because, uh, for me, this is not gardening complexity. This is more about uh, a structured Complex gardens, gardens, or complex, complex garden. garden, maybe. Um, I think gardening complexity uh, is more interesting in this domain. Hmm. And um, this already uh, shows you the whole point I'm going to make, because I will talk about how our, uh, how our relation with nature is currently changing, and uh, how many of the things we used to perceive as nature are very much structured by people and are in a way dragged into the cultural domain, as you can see here, but at the same time our own technological, cultural developments, inventions start to become so complex and uncontrollable often that we start to perceive them as a nature of its own. That will be my talk. And uh, I will not show many projects, I will just try to discuss this bigger picture, because I think this is one of the most important stories of our time currently. So let's get into that. First, I think we should just talk about the planet, think about the planet and what is happening with it. And this is not our planet, because uh, this is just a rock in the sky, but uh, it only has a geosphere. And the interesting thing about our planet is that it also has a biosphere. And it actually took about five billion years for the biosphere to grow on our planet. So that took a long time. And right now it's there, and of course the biosphere is interacting with the geosphere. They are together. This is basic lesson in evolution. But now what is happening more recently through human uh, intervention, people came there and we created a so-called noosphere. This is not something I invented. This was already proposed by a guy called Vladimir Vernatsky long time ago, and it's the sphere of human thought and activity. And if we look at it like this, things become already quite clear, that uh, you see that there's basically evolution goes on. That's the whole story. But of course, what is our position then as humans in this, in, in this development? Because we are all born in a world that has been designed already. If you look around now in this space and you try to uh, find the most natural thing in the room, that's quite difficult. I mean, please try and find something natural in this room. I basically, maybe you would say this wood, wooden table, but of course it's completely cultivated piece of wood as well, or... The water. Yeah, the water, that's... There's a cactus somewhere. <laughs> well, I think actually the most natural thing in the room right now is, is you or us. Mm -hmm. We are still the most natural thing in this room. But for the rest, our environment has been designed completely. So what does it mean? This is something that I've been thinking about uh, for a long time and try to uh, figure out how to perceive this, what was happening. And this was kind of my conclusion, that we are now living in a next nature. <clears throat> so I think you know the drill, but I will try to read aloud uh, the text that's coming now. Next nature, nature is changing along with us. 
Nature, in the sense of trees, plants, atoms, or climate, is getting increasingly controlled and governed by man. It has turned into a cultural category. At the same time, products of culture, which used to be in control of man, tend to outgrow us and become autonomous. Hence, one could say the natural powers are shifting to another field. Our established view on nature needs to be reconsidered, and we propose the term next nature for this culturally emerged nature. This is real nature and not some representation of a long-lost phenomenon. No, highways, airports, supermarkets are all part of our natural environment and there may even come a moment that our connection with an industrially manufactured Coke bottle becomes more mythical than our relation with the genetically analyzed rabbits in the woods. While systems, genetic surprises come, technology, autonomous machinery and splendidly beautiful black routers, I never make it. But I have uh, some more time left to get into this topic with a little more, bit more detail. Um, some observations I want to share from my own life. How I, what I just saw, see around me and maybe you see it too. And that at least when I see this, I think what is happening. Um, I was walking with a friend in the dunes near Bloemendaal in the Netherlands. And I saw there this strange tree sticking out amidst all the other trees. It turned out that this is not a tree. This is a cell phone antenna mast disguised as a tree. Now, why is this interesting? I think for two reasons. On the one hand, it shows that we try to recreate our environment according to uh, what a natural environment should be. Um, but it also shows us that technology becomes part of our environment in a, in a fashion that we don't want to experience it anymore as technology. It becomes invisible. It becomes part of the fabric of our everyday life, and we don't see it as technology anymore. Now, most people will agree with me that this is not nature. This is, at best, a picture of nature, uh, like a painting you would hang above your sofa. And it also shows that much of what we used to call nature is in fact culture. Many times when people talk about nature, they are basically talking about pictures of nature, not nature itself. Um, nature is also a great product in our time. And I have a little clip I want to share. So, ladies and gentlemen, it, it, it is springtime again. New mobile phones are emerging. This shows that you can use images of nature to sell almost, almost everyone, everything. And here I collected uh, all the products and brands that use images of nature. And I'm, I'm sure now that many uh, young children, not only in the Western world, they know more of these logos and brands than birds or tree species. That's sort of the situation that we arrived in. And many children don't like chicken, but they, they do like dinosaur. <laughs> so this is all introduction about how, our, how, how weird our relation with nature has become. Uh, maybe this is something for the future. No, well, this is something for today. This is the meat of today. 100% made of animal, 100% unrecognizable. This is our world. And maybe this, we can do this better. Like, for instance, print the meat. That you, if, they, if you don't recognize the animal in the meat, then why would you, uh, why would you use it? Um, and then... Some scientists are already working on the next step, uh, which would be this, how to grow an organ. That's happening now. And I must say that this is a so-called artist visualization. So this organ printer does not yet exist. Um, however, scientists are working on, on, the, on these things, on growing organs. Um, and this is what's currently the state of the art. So uh, last year, for the first time, uh, an organ, and it was this piece that, of your body that was grown by scientists as tissue engineered 
piece of organ and put inside your body. I think it's quite a step because we just concluded that we are the last natural thing in this room, but that's also changing rapidly then. So where does it end? Maybe, uh, maybe somewhere here, I don't know. <laughs> Probably the ultimate female agony, uh, but that's not why I'm showing this, I, not to promote it. I'm showing all these images to show one thing, to make one point, which is that uh, we are now living in a time in which the born and the made are fusing. This is an important story of our time. This is really something that is happening rapidly in our time, and we are just sitting there and looking at it. The born and the made are fusing. And that's also why we are so confused about nature and culture. Because everything that's born used to be in the realm of nature. Plants, trees, uh, animals, climate. That's nature. Whereas culture, mobile phones, microphones, cars, uh, that's the made. And we are now living in the time in which they are fusing. Although I'm not sure if they are really, really fusing, um, I tend to say that they are trading places. And um, because two things are happening, on the one hand, our natural environment is replaced by a world of design, and at the same time, our technological environment now becomes so complex that we start to relate to it as a nature of its own. So this is about the gardening complexity part. This is uh, a changing perception, perception that we are now witnessing and have to participate in. Um, let me plot it out in a little graph for you so that we can uh, all understand what we are talking about. So if I would say born versus made and control versus beyond control, then the classical distinction between nature and culture used to be born versus made. And so here you have some natural things that are born but pretty much controlled, like for instance uh, the bonsai tree. Um, and um, above you see that there's also still a lot of old nature left that's completely beyond our control, like uh, lightning or the sun. We don't control everything in nature. There's still a lot out there that we, that we don't uh, control, and that's born nature. Now let's look at the made part. You see also some parts that, that are uh, made and pretty much controlled, like a light bulb, for instance. Um, but important parts of our technological setting are made, but nonetheless, they are moving beyond our control. And I think the financial system is a, well, out of control, out of control example that is ongoing. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, that's, that's, uh, I think, I think there should be, I think that's a good remark, and I think yeah. this system, or, or this graph, could use some improvement, because it's quite confusing. It, it, uh, one, one bill of, one dollar bill you can control, but this is also a representation of the financial system already. Good remark. I will change this graph. Thank you. But to continue, so there you have the old view of nature, everything that is born. That's how people nowadays perceive nature. But I think in, well, maybe 10 years from now, maybe 20 years from now, when people use the word nature, they will more talk about this domain. Everything that's beyond the control of people, that's sort of autonomous, that grows by itself, that we could also... See, perceive as nature and then there you have this nature caused by people going on so that's what we well talk about when we talk about next nature so it's not only nature that becomes culture that we already know for a very long time especially in the Netherlands because uh, already in the 17th century Voltaire used to say God created the world except for the Netherlands that they have done themselves so, yeah, there are some people from abroad here, but in the Netherlands we know everything about nature that becomes culture. Our country is on the bottom of the ocean, we have dikes and everything is decided and carefully planned. This we know for a long time and this is more the, the new way of perceiving things. So, let me put this a little bit more uh, in perspective. Okay, with our human culture we cause the rising of a next nature. Sounds interesting, but also quite abstract. 
Um, so I would like to try and give some concrete examples of how technology can upgrade itself or grow, uh, position itself in a fashion that it becomes a next nature. And an example from our everyday life that I'm sure everyone in this room can recognize is the mobile phone. Um, because we are not born with a mobile phone. And there used to be a time that we did not have a mobile phone. And everyone, I think, lived in a world in which you did not have a mobile phone. And you could just be fine. There was no problem. But then at a certain moment, the mobile phone was introduced. It was at first an alien, new technology. Uh, but a lot of people around you started using it. So at a certain moment, you also bought this mobile phone. And then the next day, before you know it, when you leave your house without your mobile phone, you almost feel like you are naked. Like there's this missing limp on the table. And you quickly go back to your house to grab your mobile phone. Now, the mobile phone is not part of your body. It's, but it is very important for your life and your identity. And that's not new, because you see that this happens all the time with new technologies. For instance, 100 years ago, electricity was very new technology, and there were these little plates in hotel rooms where it would be explained to people, this room is equipped with Edison electric light. Do not attempt to light with a match. Simply turn the key on the wall by the door. And then, especially, I think the disclaimer is very interesting. Um, the use of electricity for lightning is in no way harmful to health, nor does it affect the soundness of sleep. For us, we don't even think of electricity or electric light as media. We think it's, it's, it's normal, it's out there, but in that time it was a new technology and people were kind of reluctant and worried that it would not destroy their life. I could go even further back. For instance, if I would go... 10,000 years ago, and talk about what was then a new technological revolution. Well, agriculture was very new 10,000 years ago. Nowadays, if we see these, uh, these two women um, growing their crops, we think, this is nice, it's organic farming, it's in balance with nature, how they do their farming, very good. But 10,000 years ago, farming was a technological revolution. And it radically changed how people lived. Before that, we used to live as hunting gathering types on the savanna. And after farming, we settled in villages. We had more time for leisure, but also for different roles. And someone said, I'm the mayor now. Another said, I'm the priest. I'm the philosopher. Society completely changed through farming. And if I would go even further back, to an example that is even an older technology, I would maybe talk about cooking. If you see this image now, then um, you think that's a barbecue, that's sort of going back to nature. But maybe 300 years ago, cooking was a radical new technology. It was for the first time that people sort of extended their stomach and pre-digested their food through cooking before they would eat it. And that was technology and we used it and it also changed how we live as people. So as you see, if you see the whole, uh, the whole history of technology and people, stone eggs, agriculture, domestication of fire, the wheel, riding, money, industrial revolution, and now we are living in the time of the bio, info, and the nanotechnologies. That's the new emerging technology of our time. And what we learn from this, and understanding this, and I think it's important to, to know, is that we are technological beings by nature. And in a way, always when we invite, uh, invent new technologies and invite them in our lives, we are creating a new setting, a next nature that's can improve our lives, but may also be wild and unpredictable as ever. So basically, this is all the same. We are always playing with fire. And it's our job as people to find a course through these new developments that's, well, not too modest towards radical new technologies, but also not too irresponsible. 
So nature changes along with us, and um, we are not the anti-natural species, no, we are a catalyst of evolution. This is our job description, and this is what we uh, need to get around with. So to wrap it up, a few more examples from my personal life, and I think also your personal life, where we see this next nature. First of all, in the, in the supermarket. There are so many new products occurring there every week. And I wonder, is this bio, biodiversity? <laughs> or maybe we should call it techno-diversity. But what is going on here? Because people say biodiversity is decreasing, but certainly techno-diversity is increasing. And right now, today, there are already more patents filed and accepted than there are species known on the planet. These are all the razors I used throughout my life. And I look at them and I wonder, is this evolution? You see that they also tend to grow. And is this the design we want? Because, well, when I started shaving, I used this little razor with two blades. And this morning I shaved myself with this vacuum cleaner, electrically powered razor with a battery and a LED light in it. And you see these processes, they, they resemble an evolutionary process. And I wonder, should we call this evolution? Perhaps not, because people are doing it. But then maybe we should call it co-evolution. Are we co-evolving with these kind of technologies? And how is, the, how is the balance in that regard? The financial system has already been mentioned. Should we see and start to perceive the financial system as an ecology in its own right? I think we must, but what does it mean and how can we then garden it? These questions have to be answered. I think the people who are right now behind the wheel are still thinking from models of the past, that they think we made this system so we can control it and we can manage it. But maybe it has a certain autonomy that we have to accept. And finally, I don't know if people know this image. This is not some solar system far, far away. No, much closer than you think. This is a map of the internet. Every computer in the internet is plotted in this map, and all the connections between the computer are plotted out in this map. And I don't know if you think this is a very beautiful image, but I also wonder, is this a natural phenomenon that we caused? And if that's the case, how to, how to continue? But because obviously, since this picture has been made a few years ago, already the internet has developed new arms and legs and grown further. And you are there, so you are very small in a way, but the good thing is you are also connected. So I think that means you can, you can make a difference. And that's what I'm trying to do, um, at least in my life. I try to answer the question, how can we build, design, and live in this uh, next nature? And I have a few mantras ready for you um, that I, maybe we can discuss later on. I think, first of all, we need to embrace complexity. We need to get away from the idea that we need to always simplify and model complexity. No, we need to embrace it. Secondly, we need to focus more on the guiding of growth than total control. We can perhaps design processes, uh, focus on that, rather than design products. What are you designing if you are building something? I think the process is becoming more important. And I also think we can still learn a lot from old nature, so to say, and our dealings with old nature. For instance, maybe people who are now managing the financial system can learn from the traditions of farmers, because farmers are already quite keen at working with complex climates that have a certain autonomy of its own, and still they can develop a relationship with it that's uh, for the benefit of them. We are living in a time in which the maid and the born are, are merging. This, this is important. Uh, and we, uh, I think a lot of people are still reluctant towards it, but it is happening and we need to make the best of it. And finally, I think our end goal should be to create uh, humane technology. We are now co-evolving with a techno uh, technological environment that has a certain autonomy, and in order to direct it in a, in a fashion that's also good for us, um, we need to create 
humane technology. With humane technology, I mean technology that resonates with the human senses rather than numbs them. Technology that empowers people and does not outsource them. Technology that, uh, that's, uh, in the end, uh, may realize the dreams people have of themselves. I think that's, uh, that's where we should go. And my final image for today is because I think this is helpful for the gardening complexity uh, discussion is this image. This is a root bridge in India, and I find this very inspiring image. It's not something high tech, it's not something of the 21st century. It's something that exists already for a long time. People are bending the roots of trees to build a bridge for themselves. And I think this is a very interesting uh, way of constructing a structure, an architecture that we can live in. So I would like to leave it with this image. Thank you for your attention. We will have a, a more general discussion about the issue uh, after all the talks, but are there any very specific questions for Kurt at the moment? Christina? Hi. Um, is, uh, Kevin Kelly, in his book, What, Technology, what Does Technology Want, which I'm sure you know, talks about the, the technicum, mm -hmm. this idea of uh, technology uh, developing into a family of its own on par with the other families of beings. And his vision goes further. He doesn't really talk about co us coexisting with technology any further, but rather technology developing on its own and, and not necessarily any longer developing around us. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? Because you're still taking a very uh, human-centric uh, approach to this. Yeah, that's true. Which, right? And I, I, I feel that that's, there's a lot of people who are taking it a little step further mm -hmm. and saying, well, you know, it's, uh, there's going to be dinosaurs and they're not actually going to be necessarily all that interested in you. Uh, you know, yeah. You've got to bend those roots, but it's going to be maybe possibly not about you. What do you sure. think about that? Um, I, think, uh, I think this is true, and I think this, this is happening. Um, so yes, technology, if you say technology becomes an autonomous force, then that means it does not necessarily need you or us. Um, you say they take it a step further, um, perhaps, perhaps. Um, but in the end, uh, if, you, uh, if you made that observation, which I also make, that technology is becoming a force of its own, and whether you call it a technicum or no sphere, that doesn't matter that much, then the next step, of course, I think, is to think, what are we going to do with it as a human species? And then it becomes important to think about the relationship we want to have with this technology. So uh, that's what I'm working on. And uh, But do you see it as a relationship between you and something outside you? Or, I mean, I think this yeah, is seen as you're, you're, we're already part of that system. Yes, yeah, of course, we, we are, I, I say we are catalysts of evolution. That means we pushed evolution in that direction, but of course, evolution goes on and it does not necessarily care about people so it uh, it only cares about evolving and there might be a future in which human beings are just outsourced and that the te technological technicum runs on its own that's possible uh, but it's not what I want I must say so yeah and then, and then the question is, how do we make musical instruments? Do you? <laughs> and for now, and for whom? Yeah. Now we we had we did we did we did do some interesting projects together with uh, Kurt students in uh, at the Tau Ento. But Christine and I coached a couple of them as well, and Taku as well, uh, where we said, you know, can you can you design a musical instrument that grows? And this this it turned out to be a very hard assignment for for the students. Uh, they found it hard to conceptualize something like growth in relation to, you know, the relationship that that, that a musician has with an instrument. Uh, but it's it's turning it's turning out to be like a, a continuous assignment for every new yes. year. We have a new group of students that but try the, to design the, an instrument the, that can grow. The choice of gardening is really good. It's a good word because the problem I think for dealing with complexity is we don't have a word. We have this word systems theory. It's in my hand. <laughs> Hello. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. yeah. Um, 
You know, we don't have a word that's available to people, ordinary people, like politicians, because they don't really understand complexity. They understand, they barely understand something like ecology or something like that. And so I think it's good, this word, except the problem, it's a very familiar old-fashioned word, so maybe it doesn't get the point across to people who yeah. think, it sounds maybe retro. Do you think it's, I mean, it's par partly the responsibility of writers and philosophers, but they don't understand these things either. Um, it's, so it's partly the responsibility of people like industrial designers who do, in fact, face these systems more head on to pre perhaps come up with terms which are available for ordinary people to try to begin to comprehend what a complexity really is and what a complex system is and the fact that control is decentered and things like that. Yeah, I think the important thing is that you uh, maybe you should not wish to comprehend what a complex system is as long as you can deal with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I don't mean comprehend in that sense, but I mean to be able to... to, to, to yeah, on that. another just, level. Yeah, just, just in the way that, find, clearly in Europe right now, the idea of dealing with complex money is actually not acceptable in Europe, right? There's I no, think just so, not yeah. able to deal with yeah. it. Yeah, where if you go to a farm and you talk uh, to a farmer about how he deals with the complexity of the environment and the climate, it's not in his control, but he knows how to deal with it. I, I once talked to a gardener, and, and he said their, his company made a very clear distinction between what they called culture gardens and nature gardens. Uh, culture gardens are gardens that are completely designed, and he says they're great for business because you have to continuously cater to them. You know, you have to continuously make sure that everything is cut in the right way. And, and nature gardens, he said, you know, are much more loosely controlled. You know, every once in a while you take a look at them, you sow something, and half a year later you see what happened. And so he, he you know, as a gardener, as a professional in, 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 in this world almost, he really had all these ideas about how you nature something, or, uh, how do you nurture something that, that, that is growing. So I thought that was a very interesting uh, metaphor. Okay, uh, if there are no, not any uh, urgent questions for court anymore, I'd like to move to uh, Chris Salter. Chris is uh, director of, hang on, this is a very long uh, title, <laughs> the director of the Hexagram Institute for Research Creation in Media, uh, in Media, Art and Technology at Concordia University in Montreal. Is that correct, Chris? Yes. Okay, very good. <laughs> it's a long one, though. It's a long one. He's also an assistant prof uh, professor for... Uh, associate. Associate professor for... He's an assistant professor and he's an associate professor. Can you believe it? For yes, computational it's very arts. Yeah, I should just ask these guys <laughs> to introduce themselves. Uh, anyway, uh, we've asked Chris to talk about uh, the, the concept of complexity uh, in a more general sense. What is it and, and how could it possibly be applied uh, to arts? Are you ready, Chris? Uh, well, yes. Yes, we are ready. We'll just wait for the complexity of this uh, interface. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so, good good morning. <laughs> it's nine o'clock in Montreal. Um, just wanted to thank uh, Taku and Dick uh, and all the organizers of the festival for, for inviting me. And as I say, I just arrived this morning, so if I start to fall asleep during the talk, you'll understand why. Um, I, I want to pick up actually on some issues of, uh, that arose in, in Kurt's talk. Um, um, but, but through the lens of compositional practice, since this is, of course, time, and we're dealing, of course, with music. Um, but when I use the word composition, I, I, I mean the organization of material over time and space, right? So it could be, of course, sound, which is the under the standing way of understanding com uh, composition, but can also think about other kinds of media uh, as well. And so we're going to deal a lot in this talk with questions of temporality. Um, so the, the, the title of the talk is Overflowing the Boundaries, um, and this is actually makes very nice sense in, in from, from Kurt's description about this kind of next nature. Um, some notes on composing with complexity. And I want to start with a quote from, from the French sociologist Michel Calon, who has just written a very interesting book called Acting in an Uncertain World, uh, A Lesson in Technical Democracy. And, and Calon uses the word overflow. Calon, of course, is most well known for the development of a theory called ANT, Actor Network Theory with Bruno Latour. He's also a French sociologist whose name I think will come up a lot of times in this discussion later. And this idea of overflow signifies a kind of boundary breaking. Um, for example, in this quote, GMOs, BSE, nuclear waste, mobile phones, the treatment of household waste, asbestos, tobacco, gene therapy, genetic diagnosis. Each day the list grows longer. It is no good treating each issue separately as if it was always a case of exceptional events. The opposite is true. These debates are becoming the rule. Everywhere, science and technology overflow the bounds of existing frameworks. The wave breaks. 
unforeseen effects multiply. They cannot be prevented by markets any more than by the scientific and political institution. So we have, we have two interesting tensions here. We have the notion of composition in a context in which science and technology overflow existing frameworks. When you say composition, you say also entire sense of artistic practice. And how is artistic practice operating now in these overflowing boundaries? Um, so the structure of the talk is the following. I want to introduce this word complexity, which we've heard already, uh, to try to understand its, its ambiguity. And second, I'm going to discuss uh, a concrete artistic work that I think exemplifies some of the issues that are uh, coming out here. And, and if you're going to bear with me, I'm going to veer between computer science and physics and music composition and sociology. So in a way, the talk already overflows our, our boundaries here. Um, so um, I should say first that so over the past 15 years as an artist, I've been working on what we call responsive environments. These are just some images of them. Um, so responsive environment is a, is a term coined by Myron Kruger, a computer scientist in the 1970s, to talk about a kind of performative space that responds uh, to the presence of people in it, or human visitors. These are some projects that have happened over the last few years. Um, and of course, this response happens in the media arena uh, sound, light, heat, video, machines, anything that basically can uh, behave. Um, so these things respond to the presence of people, but they also respond uh, to themselves. But the theme that cuts through all of these projects that I'm showing you is, is the perceptual and effective. And when I say perceptual, of course, I understand the sense of interpreting stimuli coming from the environment. And affective meaning how does it, what is the kind of emotional or bodily response that that stimuli creates. Um, there's this relationship between percept and affect between the body and the environment. Okay, so I'm going to begin with two quotes. So first is from Mark Weiser, who some of you might know invented the term ubiquitous computing, which we're now surrounded by. And uh, he was at Xerox Park in the 1990s um, in Palo Alto. And this is a quote from 1991 in a very famous article, which is called The Computer in the 21st Century, in which he says, the most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they are indistinguishable from it. But most importantly, ubiquitous computers will help overcome the problem of information overload. There is more information available at our fingertips during a walk in the woods than in any computer system. Yet people find a walk among trees relaxing and computers frustrating. Machines that fit the human environment, instead of forcing humans to enter theirs, will make using a computer as refreshing as taking a walk in the woods. Well, we're not really there yet, uh, as you all probably know well and good. However, I want to juxtapose this idea of ubiquitous computing, which is this idea of transparency, that many, 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 many computers will start to disappear into the frameworks of everyday life, and we won't have to deal with them anymore, right? And a lot of people think that's mobile computing, but actually Weiser was thinking about how computers disappear into the environment. Okay. Now, this, of course, is a picture of Yanis Zanakis in his rather interesting ramshackle studio filled with lots of books and manuscripts and this kind of interesting ge geometry above it. And I want to uh, kind of compare this notion of complexity that Weiser suggests, which is lots of many, 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 many computers with um, a concept that Zanakis uh, talks about. Now, Zanakis is appropriate in this context because he sets up part of the context of the talk, but also if we think about the possession of music, right? So it's talking about music and a kind of tension in music between, you can see in the 20th century, kind of two opposing forces. One is linear causality as a series of sequences in which you have a kind of hierarchy of tonal relationships and tonal functions, right? And what Zanakis calls a generalized causality, which he labels probabilistic, right? So probability-based. And this is the quote. If thanks to complexity, the strict terministic causality which the neo-serialist pos postulated was lost, then it was necessary to replace it by a more general causality, by a probabilistic logic which would contain strict serial causality as a particular case. Con you know, basically constrain it and contain it so serialism didn't kind of get out, out of control like it, like it did in the 50s. This is the function of stochastic science. The laws of the calculus of probabilities entered composition through musical necessity. 
Okay, this is just some images of Xenakis. Now, Xenakis' understanding of complexity is a little different. For him, complexity is the sense of opaqueness, right? Opaqueness to our perception. So, for instance, complexity in this sense leads to a kind of aesthetic confusion. So, you know, if you think about serial music, when you listen to a lot of this music from the 50s and 60s, now you say, well, it's, it's, it, I don't understand its structure. It's too, you know, it's too uh, amorphous or too opaque for me. Um, and a lot of people say, of course, it's too academic. Um, so there's an interesting quote where he says, the strict deterministic, so this is a very key word which will come up again and again, deterministic rules of serial music, and of course algorithmic computer music is, is also related to this attack, leads only to, quote, a mass of notes in different registers. The enormous complexity prevents the audience from following the intertwining of lines and has as its macroscopic effect an irrational and fortuitous dispersion of sounds over the whole extent of the sound spectrum. In other words, again, that this complexity of using serial techniques, retrograde rows and all of that, and applied, of course, not just to pitch, but to duration, to dynamics, to rhythm, basically creates this kind of confusion in the listener. Okay. So what does this ubiquitous computing have to do um, with this notion of complexity? So, and, and this musical issue as well. So the mapping problem. Okay, now this is, of course, the standard, for, for musicians in here who are working with uh, you know, digital or gesture-based instruments, this is a very f common formula. We have, we have an input and a gesture, we have a sensor, we have some analysis or features to try to figure out what's useful about that gesture, and we have some synthesis, and then we have an output. You know, in fact, if you go to the non new instrument for musical expression conferences, people define this as musical expression, which is really fantastic. You know, it's kind of one, two, three, four, five, and we have, we have music. This is a quote from my, my friend and colleague, Marcelo Wanderly. Mapping is the liaison or correspondence between control parameters derived from performer actions and sound synthesis parameters. Simple, right? Maps. Now, the interesting thing about this is the notion of performer and action. Action here equals human actions in an input-output sequence. Basically, you have input, you have some stuff going on, and then you have an output. But nothing really changes. Of course, there's these mappings going on you know, between gestures and synthesis algorithms, but you essentially have an input-output model. That's not really how the world works as we're starting to see. Now, here's the next complex thing. It's this. This is many, 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 many. Right? This is many, 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 many sensors that we have now. And then it goes to this synthesis engine, goes through features, and it goes to synthesis, right? And then you have many, many, many parameters. So anyone knows we were just talking about earlier, you have a hundred different, like, like Taku says, you have a hundred different snares on your computer. Or if you open up Photoshop, you have 300 filters. And so you have endless parameter spaces to work with, right? And music. But, you know, this is not so much different than basically that an orchestral score, right? There you have also many, many, many instruments, right? You have polyphony, right? You have many, many, many instruments, and they're mapped to many parameters. To each kind of instrument has many, many parameters. I'm talking about acoustic instruments. We could also apply this to electric instruments uh, or, or digital, or electronic or, or, or digital instruments that have computer control outside of them. But essentially you have the same problem that Zanakis identifies, this kind of deterministic flow because of this mapping, okay? Now, sound, thank you. Okay, now what you just saw is, that's the only extant clip of this work. Um, for those of you who recognize it, it's uh, Yanis and Axis Polytopes. This is the Polytope de Montréal, 1967. Um, it was, um, and then this is the next one. This is also very short. Can you bring the sound up just a little bit? Yeah. Okay, this is the Polytope de Cluny in 1972 in Paris. Now, Polytope is a really interesting project. One, because I'm working on a kind of reimagining of it, which is one reason I want to talk about it. But um, the word poly, of course, in Greek means many, and topos is space. And these were projects that Zanaka started in 67 and went up to 1978. Um, and they were these kinds of series of light, uh, sound, and architectural environments. Um, started with Montreal and ended, this is in Cluny with many, many lasers. Just some diagrams. 
These are trajectories of the lasers, which Zanaka has calculated using Brownian motion. This is the Plato Montreal. And this is what it ended with in 1978, which is the diotope, which was um, for in Bulbarg for the opening of the Centre Pompidou. Now, the interesting thing about the polytopes is Zanaka said he was attracted by the idea of repeating on a lower level what nature carries out on a grand scale. In other words, how could you work with the macro scale of nature, the macro behaviors of nature, and then realize that on a micro scale? Now, in, in a lot of ways, these, these polytopes were an attempt by Zanaka uh, to, to get away from the Phillips Pavilion. So, of course, he designed the Phillips Pavilion along with Le Corbusier in the 50s for the Brussels 1958 um, World Exposition. And there, uh, he was very disappointed in the way Corbusier used image uh, and light, because he basically had people know, he had films that were projected onto the walls of this, this hyperbolic paraboloid structure that Zanakis designed. Um, and so in, in an essay in 1958 called Notes Toward an Electronic Gesture, Zanakis was talking about another kind of way of thinking about light uh, in time. And he said, we should deal with a kind of, uh, you know, a new kind of gesture, which is, he said, a vast audiovisual synthesis which was previously unattainable and, above all, placed into the realm of abstraction, which is the natural and indispensable environment to its existence. Now, of course, Zanakis' writings are none but opaque, but what this suggests, again, is like how to think about these kinds of macro behaviors within a kind of micro scale. And what Zanakis really sought to achieve with these polytopes was to deal with this tension between the movements of mass structures over time that were composed of many, many, many different elements. Of course, we tend to think of that from, from the point of view now. We call them grains in sound. So Zanakis also was dealing very much early on with, with granular synthesis. Um, but also the relationship between light. Okay. Now, what's also really interesting is Zanakis' uh, proposal for Montreal described that project as interactive. Now, what does that mean, interactive? Well, the interaction comes from, as he said, some events within the performance may be conceived so the public may intervene interactively in the process of creation, but always on the highest arti artistic level. Now, by that, it means that as you move, as you can go back to looking at this image here of... Um, the Polytope Montréal, this is across four floors of the French Pavilion in Montreal, which has, of course, become a casino now. Um, and he had 1,200 strobes built into that wire, that steel hyperbolic uh, parabola. Um, and what was interesting about this is that he wanted to control this thing incredibly fast. There were this, this piece was six minutes long, but he wanted to have over... 90,000 changes within the six minutes. In other words, he was looking to a way of creating a kind of dynamic in the light that would be counterpointed by the score. Now, the score, um, which we can listen to a little bit, the score is continuous, but the light is fragmented into pieces. So this is for an orchestra. This is for four orchestras playing slightly in, in canon form. Um, but you could, of course, hear this kind of density. Well, what's interesting is, of course, the light. Because if I go back to this other image, you know, I showed you earlier, this video, you can see that the light does not have this continuous transformation like the sound does. And if you listen to the score, which was played across four large loudspeakers in this atrium, again, every six minutes, you can see the light is pointillistic and, and bursty, where the sound is this kind of continuous thing. 1967. Right, exactly. That's exactly what was, Joel just jumped me to jump to the next point, which is um, he wanted in the, theoretically to control this by, by computers, right? But he couldn't do it, so he used mechanical relays. Um, but what's interesting is each change was 1 25th of a second. So we're at almost the fusion rate of, of seeing, you know? And the way that Zanakis did this is very curious because 
Um, there are some notes about that he wanted to use sensors originally in the light, but of course that would be impossible at the time because of course you didn't have anything that was fast enough. So what they did was they created a crazy idea where they created a command film of thousands and thousands of slides uh, with perforations that were the kind of groups of lights that he wanted to control. And they projected that onto a table with a, an array of photoelectric cells and then those photo cells basically triggered individually these relays at 1 25th of a second. So you can imagine like the poor technicians who had to like make changes in this in this thing. Um, but what's interesting here is that interactive employs this idea of triggering, right? It's triggering in terms of the technical system, triggering with these uh, sensors, these pre-scripted behaviors. Okay. All right, now I'm at 15 minutes. So now what what is this rethinking complexity? So one of my questions is what would it mean to reimagine these pieces today? And I think you'll start to see kind of some links between things, especially in a kind of time when we're awash in data, where we're, we're dealing with this ubiquitous computing paradigm. And we have all these streams of data, but we don't really know what to do with them, right? And at the same time, we're being confronted more and more by this, as we said earlier, this kind of socio-technical worldview, which is about this swinging between order and disorder. You know? um, this We tend to think everything is completely disordered now, financial markets, the ecological behavior of, of things, but at the same time, there's some underlying structure which we somehow can't perceive, right? So how is it that order and disorder operate uh, together? Now, I want to just go back for a second and, and talk about this, this notion of... Um, Immersion. So right now in, in Montreal, my lab um, called uh, Crossmodal is is dealing with a research project that Mariah uh, Ballman's involved in uh, with two big interactive media agencies. Uh, one is called uh, uh, Moment Factory and the other is called uh, GSM Project. And Moment Factory is quite well known because they designed all of the interaction design for this, which is Nine Inch Nails. Um, penultimate tour, um, the light in the sky tour, where they had all this kind of live interaction going on on stage. This is a project they just did with Arcade Fire in Coca-Cola where they dropped these balloons under the crowd and they had LEDs uh, built by one of our graduates who runs a company that's doing all this um, uh, PixMob system where you basically put LEDs inside uh, um, objects and then you can project ultra uh, or, uh, infra infrared light and then control the behavior of the color of these LEDs. And this is a GSM that designed the Burj Khalif, which is the, the interiors of the tallest tower in the world in, in Dubai. So these are companies that do big, big installations. And we're involved in a research project with them asking the following question. How can temporal patterns be derived from multiple heterogeneous sensor inputs and mapped to lighting, video, sound, and other outputs to produce emergent media behaviors not fully anticipated by the designers in advance? Okay, so there's mapping, but there's also the question of emergence. We're trying to, so this is very technical, we're trying to do three things, which is sensor fusion, sensor analysis, and, and modeling. One is enable kind of processing of these streams of data, detect some correlations across the different channels and facilitate prototyping of behaviors that are not directly driven by that data, right? So we're trying to figure out how to put in some kind of intelligence that is not a direct one-to-one -one correspondence, but actually tries to deal with the complexity of these data streams. Chris, your, your slide says the opposite. It is? What does it say? That are directly driven. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, they are directly driven. Right, right, right. Yes, that's right. Facilitate to protect that are directly driven by the sensor data. But what I mean is that there's they're not directly mapped. There's something in between. Okay. So this is this model we talked about earlier, right? Which is this input-output model, and this is the model we're looking at, which is again a fairly common model. Um, you have an environment, you have people, you have kind of collection of data, features, extraction. But then the interesting thing is going down to this idea of dynamics. Now, what, is that, what does that mean, um, dynamical system? And that's actually a specific, uh, of course, term in mathematics, but what we also mean is kind of dynamics for the environment. All right, so let's go back to complexity. So this is, a, this is a pretty standard definition of complexity that Herbert Simon gave in the 60s, which is complex systems are made up of a large number of parts that have many interactions. In such systems, the whole is more than the sum of the parts in the sense that given the properties of the parts and the laws of their interaction, it is not a trivial matter to infer the properties of the whole. Now these are some of the characteristics we think about complex systems, nonlinearity, Right, feedback, spontaneous order, 
robustness and lack of central control. We heard that earlier. Emergence, hierarchical organization, many more is different. And lying between order and randomness. Now, of course, these are not set in stone. They're disputable because depending on the discipline you ask, what complexity is, as Joel was saying, then you get 20 different answers. But I want to focus on this last one, this idea of lying uh, between order uh, and randomness. And um, what's, I want to pose this definition. This is from an interesting text that just came out from um, two philosophers, actually, and, and a mathematician and a computer scientist called What is a Complex System? Actually, and also a physicist. There's five authors on this paper. The complexity of a physical system or a dynamical process expresses the degree to which components engage in organized, structured interactions. High complexity is achieved in systems that exhibit a mix of order and disorder, randomness and regularity, and that have a high capacity to generate emergence. That is, where interactions among the components generate phenomena and effects that cannot be trivially reduced to properties of the components alone. So what we imply here is some relation between interaction and the relationship between order and disorder, i.e. randomness and periodicity or regularity in the system. Now, this is a fairly well-known graph of complexity. Um, starting to think about statistical complexity, where, again, you have this line between order and disorder. Complexity increases as disorder increases, but then drops down as it, as it gets more disordered, and then vice versa. So it kind of goes on this, this continuum. Now, I, I don't have a, I'm not trained in physics, but I know there's some physicists in the room, and it would be interesting maybe to talk uh, later about this issue. But I actually want to connect this back to Zanakis, who, of course, was, was a, was, uh, had studied statistical mechanics as an engineer, and so you can see some of the reasons he was interested in these kind of stochastic questions. But he said, basically, that the statistical laws, other things lead to statistical uh, crossroads. So he talks about events like rain falling or a political rally. And he said, what's interesting about that is that suddenly you have these thousands and thousands and thousands of events. And you don't detect, that it, sounds, it, it sounds or acts like a disordered system. But somehow, in that, there is some kind of structure that emerges. And he says clearly, you know, there, whether you're talking about political context or moral context, the same are like cicadas and rain. So here you have social, technical versus what we call nature, natural, right, at different scales. These are the laws of the passage from complete order to total disorder in a continuous or explosive manner. These are stochastic laws. So let's just go back to this notion of complexity given that definition, which is a complex system is an ensemble of many elements which are interacting in a disordered way resulting in robust organization and memory. Okay, so that's the way to think about complex, is that many elements interacting in a disordered way, but yet there is some kind of organization that, that arises. So there's, there's a few characteristics. There's an ensemble of many elements, so you should have similar elements, although they don't have to be completely, um, they're not completely heterogeneous, right? There's, that's a prerequisite that you have a, a lot of similar elements, but at the same time, they don't all have to be of the same kind. Um, now, of course, in an interactive system, you have an exchange going on. This is between energy, for instance, or information. Um, but the components are dependent on the states on, of each other. Okay, So there is this kind of coupling. Uh, now, disorder is another thing. So we have, we have an ensemble of a lot of components. We have the interaction. And then we have disorder.